January 15th, 1947, Hollywood, California. The lifeless body of a young woman is discovered severed at the waist, drained of all blood and washed clean. Her raven hair and porcelain skin were a sharp contrast to the brutality of her murder. And as the story goes, she was an aspiring actress who'd come to Hollywood to chase her dreams of fame. But she'd only be known for her gruesome death. 77 years later, the Los Angeles police are no closer to finding her killer. Or are they? It's quite possibly the most notorious murder in the United States. This is the story of Elizabeth Short, the Black Dahlia. Hey, y'all, I'm Chris Calvert. And I'm her husband, Rob Potter. Welcome to Hitch to Homicide. For better or worse. Till death do us part. everyone and welcome back yes welcome 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 and for our friends in guam guam hafa ada hafa ada hafa ada very nice yeah and that was from our in-laws and outlaws friend sonia dunn her son was uh, stationed in guam so thank you sonia and thank you for his service Thank you for your service sonia son yes <laughs> and happy new year and happy new year yep well, wherever you're listening, be sure to like, rate, and review the podcast. You can find it on just about every podcast platform. Yep. We're even on some Spanish podcast platforms now, I discovered. Claro. And if you're new, we're glad you're here. Pull up a seat, sit a spell. Yep. We appreciate all your emails, likes, and comments. And if you want to chat about true crime and other interesting topics, like board games called Dumb Criminals, <laughs> thanks, Julie Lewis, yeah, was for posting that. It made me laugh. You should go join the H2H In-Laws and Outlaws, our closed Facebook group. Yes. Just answer a couple questions, and you're in. Yes, and answer the questions, because we can't let you in if you don't answer the question. <laughs> He's speaking the truth. Yes. This case, 77 years old. It's a cold case that has not been closed. Really? No, the Los Angeles Police Department has not closed this case. Wow. And we had more than one suggestion for this case. So I'm starting out the new year with something that was suggested. There you go. Before I go back in time for this one, let me thank some sources. Rolling Stone Magazine, localhistories.org. All that's interesting, the San Bernardino Sun, Yahoo.com, NBC Channel 4 in Los Angeles, Medium.com, Deshure.com, LAist.com, Reddit, the Los Angeles Times, DerangedCrimes.com, Archive Today, The Guardian, FoxNews.com, LACurbed.com. There are a bunch of books on this subject. I'm going to give you two of them, Black Dahlia, Red Rose, by P.U. Eatwell and The Black Dahlia Avenger by Steve Hodell. There are, there's also lots of information on Steve Hodell's website, and I will provide links to all of those sources as well as those books in the show notes. That's a lot of sources. Yeah, that's a, that's a long list. That's longer than my Christmas list. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, you ready? I am. All right. Let's do it. Elizabeth Short is born on July 29, 1924, in Hyde Park, Massachusetts. She has four sisters. Virginia and Dorothea were older, and Eleonora and Muriel were younger. Okay. So five girls, and she's right smack dab in the middle. Gotcha. Her parents are Cleo and Phoebe Short. I love the name Cleo. I don't know why. I thought you were going to say I love the name Phoebe. (laughs) No, I like Cleo. (laughs) It's great. Cleo. Yeah. When Elizabeth... She goes by Betty, by the way, with you her can close call me friends Betty, and family. But you don't have no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but when she's older and living in California, she goes by Beth. Gotcha. You got a song for that? You're gonna have to pull out a kiss tune yeah, for that yeah, I was one. Not ready to go into it. <laughs> <laughs> but all the source material actually calls her Elizabeth. 
And when Elizabeth is two years old, her family moves to Medford, Massachusetts, and this is where Elizabeth will grow up. Elizabeth's father created, get this, miniature golf courses. So putt-putt. Really? Her dad was that guy who thought it would be fun to make you putt uphill at an angle (laughs) in order to get your ball through a scary clown face, past the windmill, and into the hole. (laughs) So he was a sadist. Sorry. (laughs) I know that was very descriptive, but I have this thing about putt-putt courses. <laughs> there you go. They're designed for you not to be able to get the ball in the hole. <laughs> in 1930, when Elizabeth is six, her father fakes his own suicide. What? How, you might ask. <laughs> Cleo parks his car near a bridge to make it look like he jumped, killing himself. Why would he do that? But he didn't. Well, he skipped off to California leaving Phoebe to raise the girls alone in Medford, where they actually lived on Salem Street. Suddenly, I don't like the name Cleo anymore. (laughs) I was waiting for that. (laughs) Elizabeth grows up a beautiful girl with blue eyes and brown hair, but Elizabeth suffers from asthma, and it's pretty bad, especially in the winter. She's got all those recessive genes, honey, like you. Yep, I know what that asthma thing is like in the winter. After Cleo has a few years to think about what he's done, he writes to his wife and daughters begging to be forgiven. Hmm. And Phoebe told Cleo that Jesus might forgive him, but she was not. Uh, But she wasn't Jesus. (laughs) But she's not Jesus. She's like, too bad, dude. Yeah, yeah. Elizabeth, on the other hand, wrote to her father because she wanted a relationship with him. And when Elizabeth is 16, because her asthma is so bad, she goes to Florida for the winter. Mm. And I don't know if she dropped out of school to do this or not, but she worked as a waitress while she's there. And how old is she right now? 16. Well, um, wow. Okay. But when spring and summer come back around, she goes back to Medford and her mom and her sisters. Okay. But she'll go back to Florida the next winter in 1941 and comes back to Medford in the spring of 1942. So for two years, she did this. So she was a snowbird before it was She was a snowbird. (laughs) She really was. By the end of 1942, Elizabeth wants to move to California. Why? Well, for one thing, her dad lived there. And of course, if you know this case at all, you know that she apparently wanted to go to California to become a Hollywood movie star. Yeah. And right now, she's 18 years old. Gotcha. So Elizabeth moves in with her dad in California, but she and her dad, Cleo, didn't get along very well, and she moved out again. In January of 1943, Elizabeth takes a job as a civilian clerk at Camp Cook. Hmm. It's an army camp. Right. Which is now Vanderburg Air Force Base. Okay. And when she takes this job, because it's a government job, she is fingerprinted. Elizabeth kept this job for eight months, and while she's there, she's voted Camp Cutie. (laughs) And I'm sure all the young soldiers and airmen thought she was cute. So cute, they took her out drinking. And in September of 1943, at the age of 19, she's arrested for underage drinking while out on the town in Santa Barbara. Sorry about that. Now, after this, she's sent back to Medford and her mom. But as soon as winter came around, she went back to Florida, this time Miami Beach. Mm. And when she arrives, she goes back to waitressing. You know, I think everybody should be required to work a service job at some point in their lives, like being a waiter or a waitress. Or playing Lady of Spain on an organ Or playing, that's retail. I worked retail. (laughs) I just think everybody needs to be on the other side of the table or behind the register. It really gives you an appreciation for people who are nice. Absolutely. Because you're forced to deal with a lot of people who are just horrible humans. <laughs> I digress. I'm just saying yep. she was a waitress and that is that is such a hard job yeah. that doesn't get enough attention. Yep. But even though Elizabeth is arrested for underage drinking, I think it's the only time she drank hmm. because it's widely known by her friends and family that she didn't drink, she didn't smoke, and she didn't curse. Gotcha. Just like me. <laughs> just kidding. I don't smoke. <laughs> yeah. Only when you're on fire. (laughs) Only when I'm on fire, honey. That's good. (laughs) Thank you. But while Elizabeth is living in Miami Beach, she meets Major Matthew M. Gordon, Matt Gordon. Okay. These two fall in love, and he asks Elizabeth to marry him. Hmm. 
But they're at the end of World War II, and Matt is killed in a plane crash on August 10th, 1945, just a few days before World War II is over on uh, September 2nd, 1945. Wow. In July of 1946, Elizabeth goes to Los Angeles. She's planning to meet up with an old boyfriend, Joseph Fickling. Okay. But she gets to L.A. and Joe's moved from California. So she stays in hotels and she couch surfed around L.A. But she's basically homeless. Hmm. By the end of 1946, Elizabeth went to San Diego. And on January 8th, 1947, a man named Robert Manley, he went by Red Mm -hmm. because he had red hair. What a name. What a name. Hi, I'm Robert Manley. I'm Red. (laughs) He offers to drive her back to Los Angeles. And these two would spend the night in a hotel. But according to Red, nothing unseemly happened. They did not have sex. Okay. And the next day, Red took Elizabeth to the Los Angeles bus station, where she dropped off her luggage. Then she went with Red to the Biltmore Hotel. And according to Red, he left her there around 6.30 p.m. It's January 9th, 1947. Okay. Elizabeth is impeccably dressed. And after Red Manley leaves, she asked the hotel clerk if she had any messages. She also made a phone call, several phone calls, apparently, in a phone booth. And if you don't know what that is, kids, <laughs> back in 1947, you had to get inside a little cubby and make a phone call. That's where Superman changed his clothes. It's exactly where Superman changed his clothes. There you go. But she's at the Biltmore Hotel, and hours pass. And finally, it appears as if she's managed to get somebody on the phone. And according to those in the lobby that night, it seemed that her mood immediately changed. And she no longer seemed anxious, but happy, or maybe relieved. Hmm. Now, according to Bill Captain Harold Studholm, at just past 10 p.m., someone on Olive Street Motion for Elizabeth to follow them through the lobby window. She sees them outside the window. She's inside. They're saying, follow me. Okay. And she does. And she walks out of the Biltmore Hotel and disappears into the night. Okay. For the next six days, no one sees Elizabeth Short. Hmm. No one. Then on the morning of Wednesday, January 15th, 1947, just after 10 a.m., Betty Bursinger, a local stay-at-home mom, was walking down Norton Avenue in Los Angeles with her three-year-old daughter, Anne. They're walking on the west side of Norton Avenue in the suburb of Lamert Park. Okay. The area where they're walking is full of vacant lots and weeds because construction on new homes stopped during the war and they hadn't really picked back up yet. Mm. As Betty and Anne stroll the sidewalk, Betty sees something pale in the weeds about a foot away from the sidewalk. She thinks it's a discarded mannequin or even maybe a woman who's passed out naked in the field. Mm. When Betty gets closer, she sees Elizabeth's body. Quote, I was terribly shocked and scared to death. I grabbed Anne and we walked as fast as we could to the first house that had a telephone, end quote. Mm. Again, not everybody had a telephone back then. What Betty saw that day would baffle the police for 77 years. Wow. And it is still a cold case for the LAPD, which means none of the files on Elizabeth and the Black Dahlia case can be released. Wow. It's a 77-year-old active cold case. Wow. Betty's nude body was cut in half with a sharp knife and with medical precision at the waist Below the ribs. Really? It's called a hemicorporectomy. I think I said that right. Say that 10 times fast. Yeah, really. The two sections of her body were 10 to 12 inches apart. Mm -hmm. Her arms are above her head and bent at a right angle at the elbows. And the bottom half of her body, her legs are spread apart. And her liver is hanging out of her torso. Good Lord. Her intestines are tucked underneath her rear end, under her buttocks. Wow. There are bruises and cuts on her forehead and face, which had been severely beaten. Her hair is matted with blood. It's the only blood on the scene. Mm. Her two front teeth are missing, and her mouth is cut in each corner 
all the way to her ears. This is called a Glasgow smile. Oh, my gosh. So think about the Joker. That's what it was. Wow. It's called a Glasgow smile because in the 20th century, Scotland gangsters punished each other by carving the sides of the victim's mouth into a demented grin, and they dubbed it the Glasgow smile. Jeez. It was done while the victim is conscious. So the point is that the victim would scream out in pain, only ripping the mouth Mm. further. And this is what was done to Elizabeth. Wow. Pieces of flesh had been cut away from her thighs and breasts, and her stomach was full of feces, leading some to believe that she'd been forced to eat feces before she's murdered. She had cuts and hunks of flesh removed from her body, including a tattoo of a rose on her thigh. It was sliced from her leg and placed inside her vagina, something the police kept to themselves. Wow. But more than all the cuts and bruises, the body cut in two, Elizabeth's body has been drained of all blood, and it has been washed clean. Hmm. It was obvious she was murdered someplace else and dumped and posed in Lamert Park. Mm -hmm. She was dumped out in the open just a foot off the sidewalk. So whoever left her there wanted her found and was going for a shock factor. Yeah. The autopsy would say she died from hemorrhage, from lacerations, and shock by blows to the head and face. Yeah, Mm. Elizabeth was not pregnant. Okay. Now, Finnis Brown and Harry Hansen, two LAPD detectives with plenty of experience under their belts, headed up the investigation. And near her body, they find a heel print and a cement sack with traces of blood that they believed had been used to get the body to the vacant lot in the neighborhood. Okay. That's called foreshadowing. Uh Uh-oh. Hang on. Ready? Yes. (laughs) Now, as you might imagine, the press was going to have a field day with this brutal murder. The 1947 media was on the scene immediately. Some have said even before the police showed up. Oh, really? There were photos taken of Elizabeth at the scene. Elizabeth is the first Jane Doe of 1947. LAPD asks the FBI to help them ID the body, and Elizabeth's fingerprints come up because she was a clerk at the commissary of the Army's Camp Cook back in 1943 when she was voted Camp Cutie. Right. And don't forget, her prints turned up because she'd been arrested in Santa Barbara Uh, for underage drinking. Right, right. And with that, they actually had a mugshot that they could match to the body. Gotcha. Now, the media wanted to make Elizabeth out to be this lascivious woman. They wanted to brand her a sexual deviant. There's even a police report that says, quote, this victim knew at least 50 men at the time of her death, and at least 25 men had seen her within the 60 days preceding her death. End quote. Wow. She was known as a, quote, teaser of men, Uh, end quote. And I'm sure that wasn't true. Really? Yeah. yeah. She's a teaser of men. Come up with a better title. Well, it's her own fault that she's now dead in a lot because she teased men. Yeah, yeah. Don't get me started. I know. Don't wear those clothes. (laughs) Exactly. So these male police officers and reporters are saying she had to be a horrible, crude woman for something so horrible and crude to happen to her. Right. And suddenly the vacant lot in the neighborhood where Betty and Anne were out for a stroll was now dubbed a, quote, lover's lane, end quote. <laughs> Just bend the narrative to fit your story. Yeah. Right, guys? Ugh. That was getting clicks before clicks. It's exactly what it is. Yeah. At the time of her murder, Paramount Pictures had released a 1946 movie titled The Blue Dahlia. The plot of this movie is a discharged naval officer, Johnny. He returns to his wife, Helen, in Hollywood Mm -hmm. after fighting in the South Pacific. And with him are his two military friends. Johnny is stunned to find out that Helen has been unfaithful to him, sleeping with a local nightclub owner named Eddie who breaks up with her. Okay. The name of the nightclub, the Blue Dahlia. Mm. And when Helen is murdered, everybody around her has a motive. It's a whodunit, right? Right. And the press decided to dub Elizabeth and this murder, the Black Dahlia. Why'd they do that? 
Well, it said because the, that she wore black a lot, but I don't know that that's true. Mm. Apparently, she had dyed her hair black because her hair was brown, but she dyed her hair black. Okay. But I don't know that she always wore black. I think that's something the press made up to sell papers. Yeah, more clicks. And boy, did they sell papers. The L.A. newspapers had stories or related stories on the front page for 31 consecutive days. Wow. Selling papers. Yep. In fact, it's a newspaper reporter who broke the news of Elizabeth's death to her mother, Phoebe. Wow. A reporter actually called her mom, lied to her mother, and said that Elizabeth had won some beauty contest. And they wanted background information for the story. And when her mom gave him what he wanted, the reporter then proceeded to tell Phoebe that Elizabeth had been murdered. Jeez. I mean, can you even imagine? Heartless. Elizabeth's dad lives in California, remember? They call on him to ID Elizabeth's body. And he said, nope, not do nope, not doing it. Why? I don't know if he just didn't want to see his daughter that way or he didn't want anything to do with it. Wow. Phoebe, her mother, had to do it instead. Mm. And when Elizabeth is buried, her father even refused to attend the funeral. Wow. Elizabeth is buried in Mountain View Cemetery in Oakland, California. They laid her to rest on the 25th of January, 1947. On this same day, Elizabeth's purse and one of her shoes are discovered in a trash can several miles from where her body is found. Mm. Now, the last person to see Elizabeth alive that the police knew of was Red Manley. Yeah. So he's her first suspect. Sure. But Red passed two lie detector tests, and he had an ironclad alibi. And when they showed him the purse and shoe, Red said, yeah, that those were Elizabeth's. But Red wasn't mentally stable. He'd been discharged from the Army because of nervous breakdowns. And Red began hearing voices. Uh-oh. And in 1954, after Elizabeth is murdered and he's long gone, his wife commits him to Patton State Hospital. Red will die in 1986 from an accidental fall. Mm. But the day before Elizabeth's body is laid to rest, January 24th, 1947, somebody sent a package to the Los Angeles Examiner. It's a newspaper. It contained Elizabeth Short's birth certificate, her social security card, photos, a newspaper clipping about Matt Gordon, her boyfriend who was killed in action, and an address book belonging not to Elizabeth, but to an acquaintance of hers named Mark Hansen. Hmm. Now, some of its pages have been torn out, and we'll get back to Mark Hansen in a moment, okay. but his name is embossed in gold on the front of this address book. Okay. Now, in the package was a message made up of words cut from newspapers, like a ransom note. Right. It said, quote, here is Dahlia's belongings and letter to follow. Hmm. The items were soaked in gasoline to remove fingerprints. So this killer is taunting police and wants his fame in the newspapers. Sure. And since the contents of the package had been so carefully cleaned, police and the newspaper believed it had been sent by her killer. Hmm. I didn't know gasoline could take away fingerprints. I didn't either. Wow, interesting. However, there were several partial fingerprints that were lifted from the envelope And these were sent to the FBI for processing. But the prints were compromised in transit Mm. and couldn't be analyzed. Well, I was going to say, I mean, if it's whoever's handling all the envelopes to get it to here and there, yeah, it's going to be a... It's going to be compromised. Well, I don't know if it's because Barney Five spilled coffee on them, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Or were they accidentally on purpose damaged? Yeah. And you can make that decision for yourself as we get further into the story. Yeah, because if somebody went to the trouble of doing gasoline, you think that they would have thought about the front of the envelope being handled. Absolutely. Yeah. But why why don't they want to figure out who this person is? Yeah. That's what you have to think about in this story. Okay. Then on January 26, 1947, another letter is received by the Los Angeles Examiner. This time, it's not cut out of letters, but it's handwritten. Hmm. It read, quote, Here it is. Turning in Wednesday, January 29th, 10 a.m., had my fun at police, Black Dahlia Avenger, end quote. So he's basically saying, I'm going to turn myself in at 10 a.m. on Wednesday, January 29th. Hmm. So the letter also names a location where he's supposed to turn himself in. 
And police waited at the location on the morning of January 29th, but the alleged killer did not appear. (laughs) Surprise, surprise. Surprise. (laughs) Instead, at 1 p.m., the examiner offices received another cut and pasted letter, which read, quote, have changed my mind. You would not give me a square deal. Dahlia killing was justified, end quote. Whoa. Now, the police received several more letters. These letters didn't contain anything belonging to Elizabeth, and they were mostly hoaxes. In fact, 60 people confessed to killing Elizabeth, (laughs) and this wasted all kinds of police time. Wow. I, I never understood it. Why would somebody confess to killing someone if they didn't do it? What's up with that? They want fame. Fame. Yeah, but you're going to serve time if you get convicted. Yeah, but they're not thinking about that. I mean, even if they're in jail, people are talking about them on the news. Yeah, that's true. Wow. Okay. Now, the two cops on the case are part of what's called the gangster squad in L.A. Harry Hansen and Finnis Brown pulled in over 150 men for questioning. Okay. This is all during the first 24 hours. Wow. And the most promising of the early suspects was a 23-year-old transient, Cecil French. Police busted him for molesting women in a downtown bus depot. Mm. And cops really thought they had their man. Like, they're, like, congratulating themselves. We did it. We did it. Because they found out that Cecil had pulled the back seat out of his car. And they're thinking he had a body in the back of that car. Uh. But police chemist Ray Pinker determined that the floor mats of Cecil's car were free of blood or any other physical evidence of a bloody murder. Okay. So the big question for 77 years has been, who killed Elizabeth Short? Mm -hmm. Who murdered her and cut her body apart? Mm. And I obviously can't go through all the suspects the LAPD questioned or detained because there were 150 of them and 24 who were considered viable suspects, not to mention the 60 confessions to the murder. But we're going to talk about the most likely killers, starting with Walter Bailey. Okay. Walter was a surgeon in L.A. who lived just a block away from the vacant lot where Elizabeth is found. His daughter was a friend of Elizabeth's oldest sister, Virginia. She'd been a bridesmaid in Walter's daughter's wedding. Hmm. Six degrees of Kevin Bacon. Yeah. (laughs) After Dr. Bailey died in 1948, his widow says that her husband's mistress knew a, quote, terrible secret, end quote. Oh. Now, Walter's never going to be a suspect in 1947, but part of the theory in Walter's guilt is that the lot where Elizabeth is found is only a block away from where his estranged wife, Ruth, lived. And also, Elizabeth would often lie to men saying that she had a son that died tragically. Well, Walter actually did have a son who died tragically at the age of 11. His Mm. son was hit by a car. Mm. And Walter's son's birthday? Yeah. January 13th. Ooh. And Elizabeth is found on January 15th. Yeah. But Elizabeth's body is cut with medical precision. Right. So was her killer a doctor? Right. Hang on to that thought. Okay. Another suspect, Norman Chandler. Norman was the publisher of the Los Angeles Times from 1945 to 1960. Okay. And in this scenario, Norman gets Elizabeth pregnant while she's working as a coal girl for notorious Hollywood madam Brenda Allen which led to her murder at the hands of gangster Bugsy Siegel. Oh, yeah. Now, the problem with this theory is that LAPD says Elizabeth wasn't pregnant, right. and they had zero evidence that she ever worked as a sex worker. Right. Then there's Mark Hansen. Mark was a Hollywood nightclub owner. Elizabeth lived with Mark for a short time, either as a paying boarder or as a guest for two weeks in October and 10 days in November of 1946. Okay. It's really interesting to me because we've done older cases, even when like people were taking the census back then, mm-hmm. and people had borders in their house. Really? Yeah, just like living in a room. Wow. And that's exactly what's going on. Wow. Mark's girlfriend, Ann Toth, shared a room with Elizabeth, and this house is near Mark's nightclub. Elizabeth called Mark from San Diego on January 8th, making him one of the last people known to have spoken to her. And according to the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office, Mark contradicted himself in several statements to authorities about what he and Elizabeth chatted about. Mm -hmm. He said Elizabeth could have phoned him the night she disappeared at the Biltmore Hotel. Then he admits she called, 
but said that Elizabeth phoned and asked to come back to live with him. And he said, he told Elizabeth, okay, come and stay with me until you can find some other place. Right. And he tells police that he said to Elizabeth, the second time they ask him, you cannot come to stay with me because Anne is not here and she wouldn't like it. Hmm. Elizabeth had told Anne Toth that Mark was trying to sleep with her, Hmm. that he was very jealous. And she had to leave boyfriends at the corner so he wouldn't see them. Really? And Mark Hansen actually called a dressmaker and invited her and her husband to come over for drinks and, quote, see the most beautiful creature in Hollywood, end quote, Mm. meaning Elizabeth. Yeah. They went over and met with Elizabeth. And the next day, Mark brought Elizabeth to their home and ordered two dresses for her. And Mark admitted that he didn't want Elizabeth to go out with those boyfriends of hers. On the evening of December 6, 1946, Elizabeth had dinner with Mark Hansen at his home, and he took her alone up to the Chancellor Hotel. And according to Mark, she cried and said she was leaving, and she was going north to see her sister in Oakland. According to Mark, this was the last time he saw her. Now, Ann Toth and her friend Leo Heim said that Mark was crazy about Elizabeth and jealous of her and that he is a man who must have what he wants. Hmm. So he had tried to seduce her and she shunned his advances. Right. And Mark Hansen was one of the first serious suspects in the case. And he was still a prime suspect as late as 1951. Okay. But Mark Hansen was linked to three other suspects, all medical doctors. Dr. Patrick O'Reilly, who attended sex parties in Malibu with Mark Hansen. He'd also been convicted of assault with a deadly weapon for taking his secretary to a motel and sadistically beating her to near death just to satisfy his sexual desires that did not include intercourse. Wow. Dr. O'Reilly was once married to the daughter of an LAPD captain who was a known bisexual, something I'm sure that was kept under wraps in 1947. Oh, yeah, yeah. Also linked to Mark Hansen was Dr. M. M. Schwartz and Dr. Arthur Fott. Dr. Schwartz gave a statement that he studied surgery and that Elizabeth was on the make for him, meaning she liked him. Yeah. But that she was the patient of Dr. Arthur Fott, who was treating her but wanted nothing to do with her. Okay. He tells police that Elizabeth had a Bartolin's cyst, which is located inside the vaginal opening. And Dr. Fott had lanced this cyst several times and said Elizabeth would not be having sex with anybody. Mm, Right. So these two, even though they partied with Dr. Hansen, sex parties, and had Elizabeth as a patient, and were doctors who would have had surgical experience, Mm -hmm. they're let off the hook. Right. Now, here's an interesting tidbit. One of the LAPD members of the gang squad, which was the unit that was investigating the murder of Elizabeth, Officer Richard Williams and his buddy, Con Keller, who was also on the gangster squad, both believed that Mark Hansen was the killer. Now, we know this now because Richard's son, Buzz, who followed in his father's footsteps and also became a cop, wrote an article in the year 2000 saying that his father and Khan both thought Mark was the killer. Mm. Why? Mark was Swedish and born in Denmark, and before he came to the United States, Mark spent time at Sweden's medical surgical school. Really? So Elizabeth's body is cut in half with precision, the precision of somebody who's dissected a human body before. Right. And these two cops, Williams and Keller, said that Mark threw all these elaborate parties at his Hollywood home and plenty of members of the LAPD, including the chief of detectives, Thad Brown, and his brother, Finnis, would go to these parties and help Mark Hansen cover his tracks. (laughs) Wow. Man. And one of the reasons these two cops think the situation between Mark and his connections to the police are nefarious Well, Mark owned a Ford Lincoln Mercury dealership on Hollywood Boulevard. And after Mark is cleared of any connection to the Black Dahlia murder, his LAPD friends were all driving around (laughs) L.A. in brand new Lincolns. Oh, man. Quite the coinky dink. That was totally coincidental. 
Also because who were the two LAPD officers in charge of the case? Yeah. Harry Hansen and Finnis Brown. Right. Finnis's brother is the head of the detectives. Mm. And the address book that's mailed to police along with her birth certificate, social security card, and photos, it turns out it belonged to Mark Hansen. It was embossed with his name on it. He'd never used it. Elizabeth had been using it as her own. Mm. Next is Leslie Dwayne Dillon. Leslie is a 27-year-old bellhop who is an aspiring writer. Leslie also used to work as a mortician's assistant. Ooh. Someone who would know their way around dissecting a body. Sure. Leslie becomes a suspect when he started writing to the LAPD psychiatrist, Dr. DeRiver, in October of 1948. Leslie found Dr. DeRiver's name in a true detective magazine where he's quoted on the Black Dahlia case. So Leslie writes to the doctor with his own theories of who killed Elizabeth. Okay. And remember, Leslie is an aspiring writer. Right. He tells the doctor in his letters that he has an intense interest in sadism and sexual violence and wants to write about it. Really? In Leslie's letters, he calls himself Jack Sand and tells the doctor that one of his friends, Jeff Connors, is probably the killer because Elizabeth threatened him. Really? She was going to reveal information about, quote, an affair not considered proper by the average person, mm. end quote. There you go. Leslie also gives them details. He said Elizabeth had been murdered in a motel room. And as they exchange letters, Dr. DeRivers starts to think that this Jeff guy Leslie is talking about is just a figment of Leslie's imagination. Mm -hmm. So Leslie agrees to meet with the doctor, and this happens in Las Vegas because Leslie didn't want to come back to L.A. Okay. He meets with Dr. DeRivers and some undercover LAPD officers over the course of a couple of days before driving to San Francisco where they look unsuccessfully for this Jeff Dillon guy. Okay. And this is when Leslie offers up even more details about the murder. He says that Elizabeth had a tattoo of a rose on her thigh and that it had been sliced from her thigh and shoved into her vagina. Only the killer would know those details. Something the police did not release to anyone. Yeah. And that, folks, will get you taken into custody. Yeah, real quick. <laughs> real quick. Undercover cops take him back to L.A., and while he's in custody, he flies a postcard out his window that's out to the outdoors. Yeah. He flies a postcard out asking for help. Ugh. And someone's passing by, picks it up, turns it into the LAPD. <laughs> but despite all the evidence pointing to him, Leslie Dillon was never charged with the crime. You're kidding. Nope. Even though he knew about the tattoo yeah. and the yeah. remove, uh, mm -hmm. And do we have a reason why? Hang on. Okay, hanging. British author P.U. Eatwell, the author of Black Dahlia, Red Rose, The Crime, Corruption, and Cover-Up of America's Greatest Unsolved Murder, says that Leslie Dillon killed Elizabeth for Mark Hansen because he worked for Mark. Uh. Her theory is that Elizabeth was murdered at the Astor Motel where Leslie had reportedly stayed and where motel owners Henry and Clora Hoffman admitted to finding, on January 15th, 1947, one of their cabins, quote, covered in blood and fecal matter, end oh, quote. Really? Yes. The Astor was a small, 10-cabin motel near the University of Southern California, and not only did Henry and Clora find one room covered in blood and feces, there was another room where someone left behind a bundle of women's clothes wrapped up in brown paper. Hmm. The clothes were stained with blood. But Henry Hoffman didn't report any of it to the police. <laughs> he just cleaned it up. What? Henry liked to beat his wife, Clora. And he had been arrested for battery four days earlier. And he didn't want to talk to the police. Jeez. He didn't want to be a suspect. Wow. There were witnesses who stayed at the hotel on January 15th, 1947, who said that they remembered seeing a dark-haired girl who looked like Elizabeth and a man who fit the description of Mark Hansen as well. Hmm. And remember Buzz, the cop whose father and friend were on the gangster squad? Yeah. 
He says he remember his father and Con Keller talking about how Leslie claimed that Elizabeth was murdered because she was involved with a member of his gang, a gang that Leslie was also a member of. Hmm. The gang would rob hotels. They would get one of the gang members to take a job as a night bellboy, look around and find the location of the hotel safe. And then after the bellboy quits his job, a few days later, they would come back and rob the hotel safe of jewelry and cash. Gotcha. So Eatwell thinks it's more than one person in on Elizabeth's murder. I don't think she's, I think she's probably right about that. Yeah. Here's what she says, quote, But because there's no forensic evidence, it's almost impossible to say this person hit her on the head. This person cut her in two bits. What I can say on the basis of the evidence in my book and on the basis of what's come out since is that Dylan, Mark Hansen, and Jeff Connors were mixed up in this killing, and it took place at the Astor Motel. Hmm. It was covered up because Mark Hansen had connections with the police, end quote. Right. And the hotel owner didn't want the police there because he didn't want to bring any suspicion upon On him because he beat, he had just been in trouble for beating <laughs> his wife. <laughs> wow. Now, remember Leslie Dillon says that Jeff Connors is probably the guy. So police have been looking for Jeff and he did actually exist, but his name is really Artie Lane. Okay. Artie lived in L.A. at the time of the murder and was employed by Columbia Studios as a maintenance man. And Columbia Studios' lot was a place that Elizabeth liked to hang out. Maybe she's trying to be discovered. Yeah, she was uh, She was trying to be the girl that sat at the counter in the soda fountain. Yeah. Yeah. Are you an actress? No, but I want to be. I want to be. You know that's how Charlize Theron yeah. was discovered. She was standing in a line at a bank. Wow. Yeah, and somebody said, are you an actress? And she said, no, but I want to be. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I wonder if that would happen for a film composer. Let's see. <laughs> what line could I stand in to get an A-list film? I don't know. Maybe you just have to, like, blast a soundtrack or something really loud in your back pocket. Maybe. Yeah, exactly. Hard, hard, to, hard to judge that one, right? <laughs> true, true. They tried really hard to pin something on Artie. And the police could never really account for Leslie Dillon's whereabouts between January 9th and the 15th. And because they disparaged his name as being the killer of the Black Dahlia, Leslie got himself an attorney and sued the city of Los Angeles. Oh, wow. He dropped that case when it's discovered that he's wanted by the Santa Monica police on (laughs) robbery charges. All these characters are just messed up. I know. I know. But there's a reporter that says this didn't happen and that he did, in fact, get money from the city of L.A., okay. maybe just under the under the table. Right. Leslie Dillon left California. I would, too, Leslie, yeah. and went back to his home state of Oklahoma. He would avoid extradition to California for any further questioning or arrest because Leslie was related to the governor of Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Gee whiz. And there are those who've said that Leslie's ex-wife, Georgie Stevenson, was related to the Illinois governor, Adelaide Stevenson. Holy cow. Who contacted the Oklahoma governor on Leslie's behalf. Wow. Although none of this has ever been verified. There's a whole lot of hearsay in this. Next thing you know, they'll all be related to Santa Claus. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Finally, I want to talk about Dr. George Hill Hodel Jr. Okay. Born in 1907 to wealthy Russian Jewish parents, George Hodel was raised in Pasadena as an indulged prodigy. Hmm. At nine, he played major piano concerts. Wow. Handsome in a brooding romantic way, he entered the California Institute of Technology, Caltech, at the age of 14. He was. And soon had an affair with a professor's wife who bore his baby. Oh, wow. Yeah. At 14? At 14. Hey, going. Hodel would ultimately father 11 kids <laughs> by five different women. Gee whiz. Hodel's teenage best friend was another rare bird, the talented and charismatic John Houston, son of Walter. Yeah. Houston and Hodel sparred over a classmate, the delicate faced and witty Dorothy Janine Harvey. She eloped with John Houston, becoming the first of his five wives, and they ran off to Greenwich Village in 1925. Okay. Meanwhile, Hodel forced out of Caltech because he impregnated his professor's (laughs) wife, 
started a literary magazine, became a photographer, attended the University of California at Berkeley, and went on to medical school. Ah. He began working for the Los Angeles Board of Health in 1938. When John and Dorothy Houston, now back in Los Angeles, divorced, Hodel romanced Dorothy and renamed her Dorio, a combination of Dorothy and Eros, the god of love. Okay. They married in 1940, and Hodel bought the Franklin House, designed by the son of Frank Lloyd Wright. Oh, wow. George Hodel lived with his wife, Dorothy, and his kids. He was a doctor who specialized in sexually transmitted diseases, which at the time was code for, I perform illegal abortions yeah. <laughs> and take care of very high-profile people who get themselves in a bind because they have VD or they got somebody pregnant. Right. So he's doing all this for powerful and wealthy people who had wives and girlfriends on the side. And the house on Franklin Avenue was a party house. And in 1935, another Dorothy, Dorothy Anthony, a San Francisco model, gave birth to George's daughter, Tamar. Okay. George brings Tamar and her mother into the house to live. They're all living in there together. It's a harem. <laughs> so there's Dorothy, Dorio, and even for a while, George's common-law wife, Amelia. Okay. So not a normal upbringing for these kids. Yeah, think. Tamar and her mother Dorothy went to San Francisco for a bit, but when Tamar hit puberty, George wanted her back in his house, and he was incestuous with his daughter. Ugh. She was pressured to sunbathe nude. Wow. Her father gave her erotic books to read. He was determined to make her a, quote, sex goddess, end quote. She was. When Tamar was 11, George forced her to perform fellatio on him. Mm. He's such a highly sexualized man. He's molesting his daughter, throwing hedonistic parties, and he's running a medical practice that treated several venereal diseases, and he's performing abortions. Mm. Dr. Hodel holds some pretty big secrets in Hollywood, and that is power. Right. In fact, Dr. Hodel's son will say that in the 40s, there was a phrase. It's called high jingo. High jingo? Jingo. High jingo, okay. which is an untouchable person. Mm. He's high jingo. Gotcha. I'm going to use that again. <laughs> <laughs> I love that phrase. He's high jingo, untouchable. In October of 1949, George appeared on the police's radar when his 14-year-old daughter, Tamar, accused him of molesting her. Mm. There were three witnesses who testified they'd seen George having sex with his daughter, and yet he was acquitted in December of 1949. Wow. Again, he holds information about some very powerful people. <laughs> of course. In January of 1947, when Elizabeth is murdered, George had a clinic at East 1st Street near Alameda. And remember, Dr. George was quite the ladies' man. He was married with children, but he had girlfriends on the side, and George sometimes had live-in boarders. And one of those was Lillian Denorak. She's going to say that George spent some time around the Biltmore Hotel, the hotel where Elizabeth is last seen. Right. And Lillian identified Elizabeth from a photo that the police showed her saying that Elizabeth was, in fact, one of George's girlfriends. Mm. Now, George's daughter will say that her mother told her that her dad was out all night at a party on the night of Elizabeth's murder. Hmm. And that George told her, quote, they'll never be able to prove I did that murder, end quote. Really? Yeah. Wow. Dr. George Hodel will leave the United States in 1950, abandoning his family and moving first to Hawaii and then to the Philippines, where he married Hortensia Laguda. Okay. He has four more kids. <laughs> wow. He returns to the United States in 1990. He would die in 1999. And after George dies, his son, Steve Hodel, starts going through his father's things and finds a photo album in a box. Okay. There were photos of his mom, his dad and brothers. There were family portraits taken by Man Ray, who's a very famous surrealist artist. Okay. He was also a family friend. But it's two photos that get his attention. A young woman with curly, deep black hair. She's looking down. And Steve thinks, quote, my God, that looks like the Black Dahlia, end quote. Mm. It's then 
that Steve really starts investigating whether his father had anything to do with Elizabeth's murder or not. Was he the Black Dahlia killer? Right. So you see, Steve was a 23-year-old vet of the LAPD, and he was a homicide detective. Really? So he starts digging. Sure. He finds the crime scene photos, which showed that Elizabeth had been given a hemicorporectomy. I probably messed it up again. (laughs) The procedure that slices the body beneath the lumbar spine, the only spot where the body can be severed in half without breaking any bones. Wow. It was taught in the 1930s when Steve's dad, George, Dr. Hodel, had been in medical school. Mm. The letters sent to the press and police from the Black Dahlia Avenger, a man who claimed to be Elizabeth's killer, also looked a whole lot just like his dad's handwriting. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. So Steve, George Hodel's son, has found photos in his belongings that look like Elizabeth. And at first, when experts examined them, they said, it's not a match. Mm. But years later, another expert looked at him and said, "Mm, that probably is Elizabeth. Yeah. Steve has experts examine his father's handwriting in order to compare it to the killer's letters. And those results are inconclusive. Okay. But Steve has the recordings of his father. I mean, he's in a very unique position to investigate this. But at the same time, there are plenty of critics who dispute a lot of Steve's evidence. Okay. He's a very respected homicide detective when he works for the LAPD. Right. So I'm try- I try to keep all of that in mind, right? Sure. Steve begins investigating his father from the very beginning. He poured through witness interviews and newspaper articles. He filed a Freedom of Information Act to get to the files the FBI had on the case, as well as any other information they collected on his dad. Okay. Steve starts digging deeper and finds a folder with receipts for work done on his home. He finds this in the archives of UCLA, but one of the receipts shows the purchase of 10 five-pound bags of concrete. So he finds an old receipt of his father's for concrete. Right, okay. And the date on the receipt is just a few days before Elizabeth Short's murder. Hmm. And the brand, the exact same as the bag found near Elizabeth's body that police think was used by her killer to carry her. Hmm. Now, the problem with a 77-year-old case is that the physical evidence has been lost over the years. Sure. And most of the original witnesses are dead. Right. And so are the cops who investigated. Yeah, yeah. But people like to talk, including the cops, and more than one cop said to a family member that the Black Dahlia killer was a doctor who lived on Franklin Avenue, mm. which is exactly where Dr. George Hodel lived with his wife and family. Right. Steve gets an L.A. assistant D.A. to look at all the evidence he's compiled. And six weeks later, he'll tell Steve that if his dad, George, was still alive, he would file charges of murder against him. Really? Yeah. Wow. But here's the thing. George Hodel's son, Steve, believes his father was actually a serial killer. See, when Steve releases his book, a columnist at the L.A. Times gets a copy and decides to do a story. He fact-checks this. And all of this included calling the L.A. DA's office for more information about the murder. And the DA's office not only said, sure, we'll help you, they sent over a file that Lieutenant Frank Jemison, who was one of the original officers who investigated the Black Dahlia murder and had worked with the grand jury on the case, he left behind in a safe in the basement of the DA's office a copy of the notes before putting everything to the LAPD archives. Mm which are all lost, by the way, or you can't get to them because it's still an active case. And deep inside the report are transcripts. Police put Dr. Hodel under surveillance back in 1950, from February 18th to March 27th, 1950, to figure out if he could be implicated in the murder. In the surviving transcripts of microphone recordings, they bugged his house. Oh, wow. They bug his house. And Dr. Hodel was heard making highly incriminating statements. Really? Most of it's nothing of importance. Is Dr. Hodel having sex? Is Dr. Hodel berating his secretary and talking about money problems? Okay. But then on February 19th, 1950 at 8.25 p.m., they hear, quote, woman screamed, woman screamed again. And then in parentheses, it should be noted, the woman is not heard before the scream, end quote. 
Wow. Then later that same day, Dr. Hodel is talking to someone he obviously trusts and says, quote, realize there was nothing I could do. Put a pillow over her head and cover her with a blanket. Get a taxi. Expired 1259. Jeez. They thought there was something fishy. Anyway, now they may have figured it out. Killed her. End quote. Wow. Then on February 18th, 1950, another exchange is recorded. Quote, Supposing I did kill the Black Dahlia. They couldn't prove it now. They can't talk to my secretary anymore because she's dead. They thought there was something fishy. Anyway, now they may have figured it out. Killed her. Maybe I did kill my secretary. End quote. Whoa, and they didn't pick him up? He's got a lot of secrets on a lot of people. Gee whiz. Yeah. And the secretary he's referring to was Ruth Spaulding, who police had previously suspected of being murdered by Dr. George Hodel in 1945. Wow. He was present when Ruth overdosed and had burnt some of her papers before he called the police. <laughs> the case was dropped because they said there was a lack of evidence. Wink, wink. Yeah. But documents were later found that indicated that Ruth was about to publicly accuse Dr. Hodel of intentionally misdiagnosing patients and billing them for laboratory tests, medical treatment, and prescriptions not needed. Wow. Or was it that he was performing illegal abortions? Yeah. But Steve, Dr. Hodel's son, doesn't just think his father killed only Elizabeth Short. Because according to him, quote, the Black Dahlia case is like a loose thread in a sweater. You tug on it gently thinking you've come to the end and it continues to unravel. There has never been a comfortable end point to conclude his investigation. Each piece of evidence leads to another, in turn leading to another crime, end quote. Wow. Steve Hodell thinks he's uncovered a trail that connects his dad, George, to not one murder, but dozens of murders across California. Mm. And details from these murders in L.A. took him to a string of murders in Chicago, which then led him to Manila, where a 28-year-old woman named Lucilla Laulu, her body was dismembered, just like the Black Dahlia, just like Elizabeth Short, and found scattered about half a mile from his father's home in the Philippines on a street named Zodiac. Wow. And I think Steve believes that his father is a possible suspect in the Zodiac murders. <laughs> Don't know about that one. I think wow. that's a little bit of a stretch. Wow. In October of 2018, the South Pasadenian reported that Steve gained access to a handwritten letter by W. Glenn Martin, who was an undercover informant for the LAPD in the 40s. And Glenn Martin wrote this letter dated October 25th, 1948. It's three pages where he identifies... G.H. as the Black Dahlia Killer, as well as a likely suspect in the murder of Louise Springer, a 28-year-old who was abducted and strangled in 1949. Okay. So he out and out says it's G.H., hmm. George Hodel. Right. He wrote the letter to protect his then-teen daughters. He was afraid they'd be harmed because they knew too much. Ah. But as I've already mentioned— P.U. Eatwell has said that Leslie Dillon was the killer. Yeah. Or perhaps at the behest of Mark Hansen. And P.U. says that Leslie was Elizabeth's former boyfriend and he was jealous. And Leslie would go on to live a relatively quiet life until his death in 1988 at the age of 67. Now, in 2013, Steve Hodell takes a cadaver dog named Buster to his childhood home, where Buster immediately took off and ran to a vent located at the southeast corner of the property where he alerted, indicating he had picked up the scent of human decomposition. Ooh. And the vent sits just outside the basement. And according to Steve Hodell's website, on September 11th, 2013, Dr. Voss, accompanied by former Mammoth Police Department Sergeant Paul Dosti and his police cadaver dog, Buster, right. A court-certified human remains detective dog, right. they collected a second set of soil samples near where Buster had alerted to the smell of human decomposition. Okay. He did it at the front and the rear of the property. And these soil samples, apparently, were sent to a San Diego laboratory, and they have been processed, but they're still waiting for a technician's interpretation of the data. And Dr. Vass is one of the world's leading authorities on human decomposition. And he thinks 
that it's highly likely that there was a decompositional event in that space. Would they be able to pull any DNA out of that? I, I have no idea. Yeah. Yeah. But he thinks he thinks that there and right behind in a hillside directly to the rear of the former Hodel home, which at the time in 1947, when the murder happened, was an open, underdeveloped lot. Gotcha. And based on his analysis and the presence of specific chemicals, Dr. Voss believes, quote, human remains have likely been present at the location in excess of 40 years, Uh end quote. Okay. Now, this is all sent to the LAPD for detailed analysis, but I could not find anywhere where anything has been done with it. (laughs) There are some quotes from the LAPD where, and I'm paraphrasing, they said, we're too busy with murders that happened yesterday to allocate time and money to one that happened 77 years ago. Right. And as far as the Black Dahlia killer having other victims, well, there's Mimi Boomhauer, a prominent heiress taken from her Bel Air home on August 18th, 1949, while she was showing it to a man posing as a potential buyer. Her purse will be found in a phone booth in Beverly Hills with a message similar to the Black Dahlia Avenger who sent things to the newspaper. The note read, quote, police department, we found this at beach Thursday night, end quote. Hmm. Mrs. Boomhauer's body was never found and the case remains an LAPD unsolved cold case. Then there was the actress Jean Spangler on October 7th, 1949, just seven weeks after the kidnap murder of Mrs. Boomhauer. She's a film actress and former showgirl. Jean Spangler was 26 when she was abducted off the streets of Hollywood. And based on witness statements, police thought that Miss Spangler was last seen in the early morning hours of October 8th, 1949, accompanied by a man who fit the description of Dr. George Hodel. Mm. And the strap of her purse is found with a handwritten note. So this handwriting, this taunting, all of these sort of they're It's all very similar. Right, right, right. So what Steve Hodel is saying, murders in California, Chicago, then the Philippines. And George Hodel's son believes his father is responsible for possibly 20 murders. Man. And I think the evidence that Steve Hodel presents is pretty compelling. Mm -hmm. But again, his findings are disputed by others. Okay. Okay. I don't know that we're ever going to have definitive answers. There are books out there that completely contradict each other and everything I've told you today. But who killed her and why? Right. Jealousy seemed to be a word thrown around a lot, no matter who they thought the murderer was. Sure. And what's saddest to me is that she went to Hollywood to be famous. Mm -hmm. And she was, but not in the way that she wanted to be. Right. But that is the story of Elizabeth Short, the Black Dahlia. That's all I have to say about that. Hey, Hitch to Homicide listeners, the wait is over. If you're a reader or a fan of my Sex and Lies series, Book 10, Sex, Lies, and Rock and Roll is now available on Amazon. With a successful tour and two years of sobriety under his belt, rock star Noah Hart is ready to put his secrets and the past behind him. That is, until his former bandmates and business partners are murdered one by one, and suddenly he becomes the prime suspect. When FBI agent Louisa Hathaway is assigned to the case, no one, including her partner, is aware she carries her own secrets, including an undeniable infatuation with rock and roll's bad boy, Noah Hart. As the body count rises, Agent Hathaway is torn between unraveling the truth and falling for the man who might be the killer. Don't miss this new book, Sex, Lies, and Rock and Roll, by me, Chris Calvert. Only on Amazon. Rock and roll will never die, but it might kill you. The two cases that you were talking about, as far as evidence, the one about the cabin and Mm -hmm. the blood and the feces, I mean, that seems... It's pretty compelling. Yeah, clear cut. Yeah. But then you have Steve, who's talking about his dad, which must have been difficult when you're investigating your own father. No, no, I actually, I did read where he, if his dad was alive, he would want him to suffer. Mm, Wow. And when he said that to like an L.A. reporter, and I'm paraphrasing here, I mean, the L.A. reporter was like, well, are you just are you just doing this because your dad left you and all Mm. your brothers and sisters and he had, you know, five wives and 11 kids? Are you just like a pissed off kid? Yeah. Yeah. 
doing this. I mean, right. Steve Hodell is, I believe it is 80s now. Is I'm going to link to his, I'll put up a link to his website. It's very fascinating. He updates things mm. all the time. Wow. Yeah, it's 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 truly interesting. The one thing that he doesn't do that I thought was interesting was that Mark Hansen and Leslie, they, they're all into these sex parties. Yeah. And so is Dr. George Hodel. Yeah. So, and, and, and Mark is a, a nightclub owner and, you know, he's, he's got money and a car dealership. I feel like these two men, I feel like their lives crossed in some way. Yeah. Maybe it, maybe it intersects with yeah. Elizabeth Short and they were all in on it. Right. Right. Hard to say. Wow. Well, maybe someday they'll solve it. It's not looking good. No, it's not. <laughs> I don't think the LAPD wants it solved yeah. because they shoved a lot of stuff under the under the rug. Yeah, yeah. That's just my opinion. Don't come for me. Well, well, let's pull some stupid things out from underneath the rug then. Sounds like a plan. All right, with a little bless your heart. All right, I got three of them for you today as usual. Number one, man, you just can't trust anyone these days. Well. (laughs) And these first two are coming from uh, our in-laws, outlaws friend, Elizabeth Brooke Fiedler. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Elizabeth. Yes. All right, first one, Commerce City, Colorado. Okay. Robbers in Colorado were thwarted when their getaway vehicle was coincidentally stolen by another criminal, (gasps) according to authorities. Oops. They got their getaway. The criminal's getaway car was stolen by another criminal. Right, exactly. Officials in Commerce City said three armed and masked individuals robbed the high-low check cashing on Monaco just before 11 a.m. Okay. Officers were quickly able to chase down and arrest two of the three suspects. (laughs) Just who got away? You know, police said the getaway vehicle that was used by the suspects was stolen by a fourth person as they were robbing the business. Gotcha. Somebody's on foot. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Somebody in this story is on foot. Oh, my gosh. Probably the the, the police. I don't know. They also said the vehicle may have been stolen from somewhere else already. The investigation continues, and police said they don't know what the getaway vehicle looks like. Well, fortunately, no one was injured during the incident. Anyone with any information regarding the situation is asked to call the detective on the case at 303-227-7147. That number again is 303-227-7147. So you know what I find fascinating about that? What? <laughs> that it was a car stolen by a car, and then the police <laughs> say, we don't know what the car looks like. Yeah, exactly. It came from somewhere else. <laughs> Again, Uh, one of those thieves is on foot. Yeah, exactly. All right, number two. Missed it by that much. You like to do the missed it by that much stuff. (laughs) Exactly. And once again, this is from Elizabeth Brookfeeler. Elizabeth, thank you. All right, Douglas County, Colorado. Colorado. Oh, we're back in Colorado again. Yep, again. Defense attorneys for two men who stole items from a Kohl's store in Colorado, suggested their clients should face lesser charges because the items they took were on sale. What? (laughs) According to a news release. This is an attorney saying that this is his argument? (laughs) Yeah, it's pretty weak defense, but what are you going to (sighs) do? You're going to grasp on anything you can get a hold of. They stole them, but they were on sale. No, they were on sale, right. According to a news release Tuesday from the 18th Judicial District Attorney's Office, (laughs) 50-year-old Michael Green and 37-year-old Byron Bolden were sentenced to jail after stealing from a Kohl's store in Parker. The DA's office said Green and Bowen stole clothing and high-end KitchenAid appliances. They have a great kitchen section at Coles. Yeah, they do. <laughs> Surveillance video helped identify the suspects who pleaded not guilty. Of course they uh, did. Yeah. Of course they did. At trial, defense attorneys suggested to the jury that their clients should only face a lesser misdemeanor charge because some of the items that they stole – we're, We're on, on sale. sale. There you go. I hope that jury was like shaking their head. <laughs> Face palming. Yeah. Yeah. However, both men were convicted of a felony theft. Green was sentenced to 15 months in prison. Wow. While Bolden was sentenced to 90 days in jail. Quote, just because an item is on sale doesn't mean it's free to steal. And these defendants now get to think about this lesson in jail and prison. So one got 15 months and one got 90 days? That's it. 
So the guy got 90 days. He had the sale merchandise. You got it. It's bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Colorado, theft under $2,000 is a misdemeanor offense, while theft between $2,000 and $5,000 is a Class 6 felony. According to the DA's office, the value – here you go. This is the kicker. Yeah. The value of the item stolen was (laughs) $2,094.98. <laughs> you're a hundred bucks over the limit, dude. Missed it by that much. Yeah, it's not like you're 50 cents over it. It's a yeah. whole hundred dollars. <laughs> That's a lot of money. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. All right, number three. This is a short one, but I love this one. Uh, this will fit. All right. <laughs> That's me into my jeans after the holidays. There you go. A drunk driver was caught after trying to inflate his car's tires using a gas station's vacuum cleaner. What? (laughs) A concerned witness who called the police then saw the man, 21, trying to plug the garage's water line into his wheels in a second failed attempt (laughs) to pump up his tires. That's drunk. He was found to be almost twice the legal limit following his arrest at around 7 a.m. on Sunday in Scarborough. Bless his heart. Police said he was charged with drunk driving and driving without insurance. (laughs) <laughs> oh, he couldn't even get insured. You know, uh, I love the fact that he tried the vacuum first, and then when that didn't work, well, let's try the water. Yeah, and if the vacuum hose is pretty big. <laughs> the water hose, you know, I get that's usually smaller. Well, that's you know. I think when you're twice the legal limit, yeah, everything looks pretty good. The fact that he wanted to air up his tires <laughs> when he was drunk. I know. He just needed a little more air in those tires so he could get to Taco Bell, so he could get to White Castle. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Oh, <laughs> those Lord. are good. Yeah. Well, if you have a bless your heart or you know somebody's heart who needs a blessing, yep. all you got to do is go to hitchtohomicide.com where you will find a pull-down menu. Mm-hmm. You can also suggest a case while you're there. Yep. That's all we have today, our very first case of 2024. Woo-hoo. That's my amazing husband out there. That's my beautiful bride in the booth. Join us next time on Hitch to Homicide. <laughs> Bye, y'all. <laughs> <laughs>